The weekly Industry Angel podcast hears from business leaders and entrepreneurs who share their stories and that all-important light bulb moment. This can inspire us all and maybe scratch that itch and kickstart that idea that keeps you awake at night. Welcome to episode 28 of the Industry Angel. Well, as we record this episode today, it's the first day of September. Summer's drawing to an end. I must say I'm pretty ready to get back into full swing. It's it's hard to hit full steam when everyone's diaries are hitty-missy. Thanks for all the messages lately and the great feedback from last week's episode 27th with Jeffrey Moore. Uh, Johnny Bradshaw's tweeted me that Jeff's his all-time tech hero and the crossing the chasm is fundamental to any business. Glad you enjoyed it, Johnny. I know Jeff did too. David Smith, who listens while he commutes, especially enjoyed episode six with Abdallah Kablan. Uh, David's trying to teach himself machine learning at the moment, so good luck with that, David, and enjoy your trip to Barcelona. Oh, and thanks for the iTunes review also. Very important. Nice to hear from Anthony Armstrong, who won the recent book competition. Anthony's been on jury service and managed to get through some of the back episodes. Good luck to our friend James Ketchell. You may remember James had to end his Around Britain row due to illness. I know James is back on his bike now and he's cycling around Britain. So good luck, James. I'll try and catch you for some of the northeast coast leg. Nice to connect with a lot of new followers on Facebook and Twitter as well. Thanks for that. Remember to subscribe to the show and you'll receive the episodes automatically. Feedback from listeners is that the more episodes you listen to, the more younger and attractive you look. So, uh, and even if you leave an iTunes review, it makes you run, jump and swim faster, apparently. So let me know if you experience such a phenomenon. Okay, on we go. Now, usually I go into introducer mode, social marketing strategist, CMO, keynote speaker. But for me, today's guest is best described as Ted relationship Ruben welcome to the show Ted <laughs> thanks so much for having me here Ian that that's that is probably the most fun introduction I've ever had <laughs> uh, I, I appreciate that well you know it is rather than me give you some feeble intro I thought why don't you give us a minute and let us know your background is that okay Ted? Um, absolutely and you know what I always prefer that very often you know um, someone who's introduced me onto someone like this doesn't ask for a short intro and they go to my blog and you know the about me and my blog is that blah 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 you know it's like all the shit that could possibly yeah. be there and one time i'm at an event and i'm being called up to speak and the guy starts reading from that and every time he pauses <laughs> i think he's done and, and i get right and then he keeps on going and finally i literally have to go up take the mic away from him and say nobody wants to hear anymore because yeah. nobody cares about how much i talked in grade school or which teacher was my favorite, or everything else that like somebody who's telling your life story tells. So real simply, um, I, I'm, I'm a social marketing guy. I'm all about relationships. Um, I got started in digital in 1997 with Seth Godin. You really don't want to hear about everything before that because I'm 58 years old and it's just too long. Um, I, I first learned the value in the digital world of this whole relationship thing was outlined for me by Seth when he wrote the book Permission Marketing. And I was very fortunate. I, I, I sat right next to him uh, in a big office because we were the first two there usually in the morning. And I was smart enough to shut up and listen. And a lot of – I've always been a, 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 what people called a networker. I always built relationships wherever I went. And what I came to understand uh, in more recent times is that more than a networker, I am really a community builder. Um, I like to say that a network gives you reach, but a community gives you power. Networks connect, and, and they're certainly important, but communities care. And I have to say that I, I go much more to the side of the caring side. So networks are important to me, and I reach out and connect with a lot of people. But for me, what's more important is getting to know them, building that community, and kind of bringing everybody in to help each other the way communities do. Well, that's a really good point when you talk about communities, Ted. Maybe what I want to dive into today is, you know, there's a lot of noise out there at the moment on social. We've got firms practically spamming us, you know, little engagement, accounts unmanned for lengths of time. You know, what's going on, Ted? Do companies think that Instagram streets are paved with gold and they're just blah, blah, blah? You know, I, I, I don't really think that's it. I think it's more like they just don't want to deal with it. 
you know, there, there's that select few, the, the opportunists, and I mean that in a good way when I use the word opportunists, who see new, new platforms, new, op, new, new communication tools as opportunities for the small to beat the big, for the, because this is the age of influence, where anybody, anybody can build a brand, make a difference, create, cr- create change without ever leaving their bedroom. It used to be that you used to have a huge budget. I mean, even going back to just recent times, the early days of, of digital commerce and, and, and digital, you know, companies were raising astronomical amounts of money and blowing through it in a year because it costs so much just to build a website. And, I, you know, I think really what's happening is every day another platform pops up and somebody says, oh, you have to be there. And what they do is they look at the very broad scope of it is, okay, here's another place for us to put our information and our content. And by the way, I get that. I'm a content guy. I'm a syndicator. I put my content everywhere because there's value in that. But what what really turns it into gold is when you engage and communicate with people. And most of them, they either don't have the desire, they don't think they have the time, they don't know how to empower their employees to do it, and they're, they're afraid of it, and they're afraid of it in two ways. Number one, they're afraid of what might get said, although what they haven't realized, or, or they sh- and they should, is that it's all going to get said anyway. Your employees talk, people speak, people talk about you. If you're not a part of the conversation, then it's happening without you. And the other thing they're scared of, which they really have a reason to be, in a way, is that it takes a lot of work. I mean, if you want to build, get active on a platform, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, uh, um, Snapchat, anywhere, you have to be prepared for the conversation that comes after that. Because what ends up happening, I find, is that you're out there, you're putting out stuff, people reach out to you, and they get very tired very quickly when they see you have no interest in reaching back. You know, uh, and granted, there are companies that have really beautiful content or really beautiful products and people, all they really do care about is looking at. But what happens is, and it doesn't have to be everybody, a small percentage reach out, they don't hear back, and then word spreads because most people participate vicariously. They watch Ian and Ted participate and they feel a part of that participation just by watching us. The same way that if they see that nobody participates with us, That they assume, well, if they're not going to participate with Ted and Ian, they're probably not going to participate with us. So we're not even going to waste our time. And then that's why those brands start getting the people that just say bad things, that put things out there, sometimes just even test them, and to see if anybody communicates. I mean, I just had an experience. My my niece is getting married this weekend. I wanted to buy her a gift from Tiffany. And it was something that we discussed, but it was nothing more – it was something very simple. It was just a crystal ice bucket. Truth be told, I could have gotten it anywhere. But we had talked about me getting it at Tiffany. I went on to their mobile site. I couldn't effectuate a, a purchase. It just wouldn't wouldn't work. I couldn't find what I needed. The mobile application wasn't working well. So I waited. I got my laptop out. I went to the laptop. All my information was now gone that I had put in. I went back in. I found the product. And three, four times I tried to buy it. And every time, after the whole process putting in my address, putting in her address, all my financials, writing my my personal note, which by the way, in this day and age, I couldn't even cut and paste a quote from somewhere else because it wouldn't take the whole thing. It had to go to the next line. I mean, seriously, it's 2016 for God's sake and and a multi-billion dollar retailer like Tiffany can't have a site that works when you can buy one out of the box. I mean, out of the box for God's sake. So they've got some guy building them some piece of crap that, that, that <laughs> makes their products look pretty, but makes it difficult to purchase. And four times clicking buy, I get a message saying, I'm sorry, we can't complete your sale. Please come back later. Now, if this was anything else but my niece's wedding, if this was anything else than something I already told her that I was going to get her, I would have just said the hell with this. I would have yeah, gone to yeah. a different site. I would have gone to my preference for all e-commerce in the world, Amazon. Uh, or so, or even tried something and bought something somewhere else. You can't, there's a reason that luxury brands are beginning to become irrelevant because most of them think they're so important and so big and sell something so exclusive that they don't have to make it right, that they don't have to have the good customer experience, that all they have to have is their exclusive product. But, you know, so, just to finish, so uh, the point I'm making is, just to take it one step further before we jump in, is that I went to social media. Because I couldn't get anybody to answer the customer service line. 
So I went to social media and I put out something and I didn't say pound fail. I I just said, you know, really disappointed with, with Tiffany. I can't get this done. Re, I used a hashtag retail relevancy. What's going on with your site? And to this day, even though I ended up getting my problem fixed days later, they still have not responded to to the one of the posts on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. I mean, I gave them an opportunity. Well, you know what? We don't talk to people on Instagram. Or you know what? We don't reply to people on Facebook. We just do that on Twitter. Well, guess what? I didn't even hear back on Twitter. So all that broadcasting that they do, Ted, what is it? Is it for SEO? I mean, what's the point? Well, in that there's then? a few points. First of all, in their minds, it's somewhat free because they're not paying to put those ads out there for the ad itself. They, they might be adding buys around it. They might be doing other things with it. But for them, it's like, hey, we can post here, we can post there, we can post there. Why not get our name out everywhere? And I get that. The other side of it is definitely SEO. Because this, I mean, look, I only reason I post my content to Google Plus is for the indexing. That's the only, that's sure, the only yeah, reason. Yeah. I have no other interest. I don't believe there's much of a community there. I mean, there are some professionals there doing stuff, but there's no consumers there for sure. Uh, and there's very few like companies there looking for, you know, for, for thought leaders or for social media strategists. But I know that if I post my content there, it gets featured better by Google than if I don't. And, uh, you know, so I believe there, and that's true, obviously, the more places you put your content, the more likely it is for people to see it. So I think part of it is that, I think part of it is, hey, why not? We've got another place we can throw out our shit, so why don't we do it there? And then in their own deluded minds, they think people love their brand so much that they'll just be happy looking at their stuff and seeing their offers and getting their discounts and all this other stuff. And then there's the naysayers out there who say, you know, social media doesn't work. It's a waste of time. How many people can you possibly communicate with? You know, McDonald's sells 26 million hamburgers a day. How many people can they possibly talk to on social? But I think where these people are missing the boat is, number one, when someone just simply likes your page, they're that much more likely to feel a relationship with the brand and continue to buy from you and feel some some sort of trust and loyalty. Number two is goes back to what I was talking about, about how people participate vicariously. The vast majority, the vast billions of people on social media don't like brands, don't comment on their pages, don't even make a comment on their own pages. But they're this is media. They're in there reading. They're in there absorbing. They're in there more than they are anywhere else in the world. And when they see these conversations and they see us having them, they feel closer. Just like being at a cocktail party in a big room with a few hundred people and there's only 10 guys talking or 10 women talking in different pockets of the room. And most people are just gathered around listening. And only, let's say, 20, 30 people around a person hearing them talk, one or two people interact. Everybody that walks away feels that they have a relationship with that person, that they got closer to them. You know, you mentioned about employee um, empowerment, I think it was, or engagement. We spoke there about how many people can, a, can an organization respond to. What about if you empowered the, the team, you know, the senior management team said to all, all the employees, right, okay, we want you to step up with social, you know, put some guidelines around that. Would that not have an all-around positive effect on the employee, the business, and the customer relationship? Think about how simple this can be. So a back, let's see, my daughter's tw- about six years ago. My older daughter was 15 years old. And she, she, I'm a divorced dad. I don't get a lot of time with her. And as you know with most kids, they're, they're not interested in speaking on the phone. They text you. Well, my daughter texted me and said that she wanted um, Adobe Photoshop. Because, you know, it happened. She's into photography and she's an artist. But all I got was, Dad, I need Adobe Photoshop. And I texted back and said, okay, well, this is something we have to talk about. You know, because this is not that simple. It's a few hundred dollar purchase. And you don't just get a text saying, yeah, sure. So I was able to leverage it into a conversation. And as a dad, that's the world. Uh, but, <laughs> but during this conversation, my daughter made really good points. You know, Dad, I'm an artist, and now I'm doing photography, and I'm using the photography to enhance my painting. And I want to I wanna be, I wanna do this for a living. I want to go to art school. And it all made sense. And I said, great, let's get you Adobe Photoshop. And she says, okay. And then, of course, the, the divorced dad part comes in when she says, you know, Ma, I want you to buy me the real Adobe Photoshop. Mom says you'll get a pirated version to save money. <laughs> you know, of course, right? So I laugh and I say, honey, I understand that. Why don't you come over tonight and we'll buy it together. We'll bring your laptop. We'll get it together. And she goes, well, you know, it's not your night. I said, well, tell your mom I'm buying this for you. She doesn't have to. 
And she, so she comes over. Now, we're still in distress because my daughter always got a lot, really hard time from her mom when it wasn't my night. And we're sitting there trying to download Adobe Photoshop. And I don't know if you've ever tried. It's the greatest product in the world, but it's almost impossible to download without a hitch. And if you're not really technologically savvy, it can be a problem. And I'm not. And it wouldn't download. And we're having problems. And my daughter's getting stressed. And the text is going off every five minutes from her mom saying, when are you coming home? It's not dad's night. And finally, she says, dad, I thought you were going to get me the real one. And I go, honey, we're at adobe.com. I said, let me see what we can do. So, of course, I call the 800 number. And what do I get? A recording saying it's after hours. And I can call back tomorrow. So I go to Twitter. And I don't complain. I don't even tag Adobe. Because I'm not looking for Adobe to help me. I'm thinking Ian might help me or another friend who's technologically savvy. So I tweet out to all my followers, hey, can somebody help trying to download Adobe Photoshop to my daughter? Limited time, can't get it done. Within seven to eight minutes, I got 12 responses from Adobe employees around the globe. Now, let me tell you how incredible and probably costly the training was. So I'm sure nobody else can afford to teach their employees to do this. Every one of them sent me the same, basically the same tweet, and it said, how can I help you? I work for Adobe. How hard is it to teach your employees to say, how can I be of service? Or how can I help you? It's just so simple. Not one of them tried to fix it for me. Not one of them went beyond their bounds of maybe messing up, maybe telling me to do something wrong, maybe messing up my computer. All they said was, how can I help you? Now, they were a little more sophisticated, so they were obviously using some... Now, by the way, set a Google Plus alert. I, I, I mean, say, say, set a Google alert, set a Twitter alert. I mean, it's so easy to watch for these kind of conversations on your computers. It doesn't take sophisticated software. Now, they, they did have more sophisticated software, so all of them recognized that there were so many people talking to me that they very quickly let it narrow down to one who said, listen... You know, I want to get the right person to help you. When will you have your daughter's computer again and for, and for a long enough period of time that we can make this happen? And they did. The point of this story is anybody can teach their employees to say, how can I help you? When was the last time, Ian, that you walked in even to a retail store and the person said, how can I serve you or how can I help you? So, I mean, there are ones that do it, but so many don't. Imagine walking on an airline. Now, there's two different ways a flight attendant can handle a problem. So, and this just happened to me. I was on a flight. I was trying to stuff my bag into a, into a, a, a place it wasn't going to fit. Okay, now the flight attendant, there's two ways flight attendants handle this. One of them is annoyed, has an attitude, walks up, puts on a nasty face and says, Sir, your bag's not going to fit up there. And she tries to take it away. And what do you do? What does every single person do, no matter how nice you are? I wear good pe to be good to people shirts. My reaction would be to grab it back, to keep trying, to try to do it. But what about the flight attendant that walks up with a smile on her face and says, hi, sir, is there any way I can help? You know, and you say, oh, I'm, I, I can't seem to fit this in. And she goes, let me try. And she knows it's not going to fit. But she gives it a wiggle or two and she says, you know, I don't think it's going to fit. Let me take this for you. I'll put it right up front. Or I'll get it, you know, you'll, you'll get it as soon as you get off the plane and we'll take care of it. This is about how can I serve you? This is about having the attitude of just be nice. Be nice first. At some okay. point, you might have to change that, but there should be somebody of authority who tells you when to change that. But it's so easy to train your employees just to listen, just to say, I see you're having a problem. Maybe I can help. Believe me, most people... Do not expect it to be resolved right then and there. What they want is to be heard. They want people, someone to recognize the fact that they're having a problem. Now, Ted, you know, we're diving into culture here. But, you know, all too often I see in culture, okay, it's a, it's a red felt pool table. It's a pinball machine in the corner. It's beers on a Friday. That's culture to some companies. But, but what you're saying there is an in, inbred culture to help. That, that's not there. No, you're right. And this is what, but, but this is, you can change that. I mean, I'll give you a great example. Look at Delta Airlines. Here's a company that's reputation had really soured. Here's a company that was not known for employees being nice to people. And I will tell you, and it's not just me, because I hear this from a lot of other people. And of course, they're an airline. It, given any given day, there's going to be someone who's pissed off. But, but all in all, Delta has changed the culture of their company. And it came the culture, a culture change has to come from the top. Innovation changes, I believe, come from the middle, not from the top. But culture changes 
have to have to start. And when they start at the top, they don't just spread down. They need to be brought in th- through the bottom and seeped up. And that's a way of, first of all, telling your employees you value them and that you expect them to value each other and to value your customers. And I've seen a huge change in, in, at, at Delta. I mean, and I used to avoid flying them. And now, they're other than JetBlue, they're my go-to airline. Does that come from a, a CEO, Ted? Is that top senior management team having that ethos and, and pushing it down? I think the decision to begin it starts up top, okay, when it comes to a culture change. Remember, I'm not talking about innovation. I'm not talking about changing sure. your product line. I'm talking about when it comes to we are going to change from being a difficult company to deal with to being a pleasant company to deal with. I believe that has to come from the top because people look – up. They want to know that this is something that number one is is being accepted by senior management, that number two is being rewarded by senior management, and number three is being practiced by senior management. Because, you know, I, I grew up with a dad that said a lot, um, do like I say, not like I do. And I made a very, and I loved my dad, and he was fantastic. He just came from a different time. And, and, and I was very much concerned with, for my daughters, of saying, do like I do. You know, and of course, as parents, we all have, and even as leaders, we all have those times where we have to do something that isn't something we want to set the example with because you're late for a plane and you've got to cut the line if you're going to make the flight or something. But all in all, I want my daughters to grow up with the attitude of be good to people and make that extra effort to be nice and to take that t- step back and take that breath. And I think in an organization, if you don't see your, your, your C-level team doing that, why would you think it's something important in the company? Do you think that the C-suite doesn't take that decision sometimes because it's going to affect the bottom line? Uh, I think there's two reasons. I think number one is a lot of them are still living in the world of do like I say, not like I do. And they use the excuse of, oh, I'm responsible for 100,000 employees or I'm responsible for this. I can't be that way. You know, and, and, and then the other part is I think that in the short term, they worry about their bottom line. So many companies do, and they don't have a long enough view. Now, there are a few companies that have had great look – at, look at Amazon. I mean, Jeff Bezos ignored Wall Street forever. He was, he was fortunate in the one hand to have enough control of his company to do what he wanted. He was brilliant, of course, and you know, without that, without the genius, some of these things can happen. But he always took a view 20 years out. He didn't care about profits, but he did care about – people thought he didn't care about profits. He just was more concerned with investing that money in other places than with showing a profit on the bottom line. Amazon could be way more profitable tomorrow. I mean, they already are, but they could be way more if they were willing to sacrifice the future, but they're not. And too many companies, and a lot of it, look, I'm not, I'm not an anti-Wall Streeter by any means, so don't, don't, don't take it that way. But a lot of people are so swayed by the investors and their quarterly results that they don't look long enough down the road. And I think that's one of the biggest problems when it comes to social media, social marketing, relationships, um, culture changes, customer experience. Because sure, a change in, in culture, a change in customer experience could very likely affect your bottom line in the short term. But my contention, and I think it's been proved out by a lot of different brands, is that in the long term, it will make your company way more profitable and last a lot longer when you care about customers. I mean, you look at some of the best companies in the world, the ones that have lasted the longest and have been able to reinvent themselves, the customer always is in the center. It's funny because you're also thinking about the employees as well. You know, employee turnover can, can be high. But I mean, I wrote an article last week on personal branding, for instance, and you know, it's not new. But what I was trying to say is it's not a shallow thing to do because you're not always going to be getting those 25, 30, 40 year service rewards medals anymore. Huh. You know, you, you're probably going to you're probably going to bounce around a bit. So building your personal brand, you just have to do it because there isn't that employee engagement there than Look, there used to be. I say this all the time. Your personal brand is so important because the average tenure of an employee today is under three years. And a really? lot of wow. people like to say that's because, oh, millennials hop around and they change jobs. Well, there's a good reason they hop around and change jobs. First of all, they're fired a lot. I, and not because they're bad. Don't don't take that in the wrong way. Because companies just they 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 gear up, they 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 pound down, they they bring in people, they get rid of people, they don't invest in people. You know, there's a great yeah. slide that's appeared on a lot of presentations around the world the last few years. And, and I love it, and I hope I get it right. But what it says is, um, C, CF, C, CFO says the CEO 
what if we train them and they leave? And then CEO yeah, yeah, yeah. says to CFO, what if we don't and they stay? And, sure. you know, it really goes to the heart of it because a lot of the people holding the purse strings say, listen, I'm not paying for training. They're going to be out of here in two years. But of course they are because you're not training them because you're not giving them. You know, one of the reasons American Express uh, has employees that love them, past and present. And when people leave, I, I don't know about you, but I've never heard someone say something bad about their about their American Express experience because they leave there smarter, better and they get jobs. And even when they get let go or downsized, they're given the opportunity to find another job. They're supported. They're trained. And the same is true of P&G. I mean, it's like a university. And, and you know, people might say, oh, my God, it was so hard working at P&G. But, oh, my God, am I glad I started my career there? Or am I glad I stopped there along the way? You know, and, and, and what I think is that a lot of training is going by the wayside now. A lot of growth is going by the wayside. And that's why employees are leaving quicker because they're saying, hey, I got to find something better because, you know, this world's getting tough and job hunting is getting tough. And I need to make sure to, to improve what I'm doing. And to me, that's why brand building, personal brand building is such an important part of it. Unfortunately, because we use the term personal brand building, it sounds like we're a business. But it's really just about letting people know who you are, you know, building up what people can find out about you. Remember, every single job search today is done via social platforms, every single one, okay? LinkedIn, you know, I, I, I have a friend who recently got a job with Microsoft as, as a recruiter, and, and he's been in other recruiting jobs, and he has to show them the search algorithm he'll use to fill a certain role as part of his interview process. You know, well, because all the information is out there. It's just like I tell my kids and I tell college students and I tell people out of school that what you're putting out there is what people are going to use. They're going to want, first of all, they want to know how social you are. They want to know, are you using social marketing? They want to know how many followers you have. They want to know how much influence you have because employee advocacy is a huge growing um, area right now. And if you have a workforce of 10,000 people and the average person in your workforce has a hundred followers versus a thousand followers, think of how much more ability you have to spread your message if it's the latter. Yeah, I see where you come from. I see where you come from. There's tools out there which will do that, isn't there? You know, software tools that will go out there Look at the person's uh, social engagement, and then come back with a with a with a figure oh, or a percentage or whatever. All this plus, it's just, it, 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 by the way, it's it can be a lot simpler than that. Just go to the look at their social platforms. See how sure. I mean, a lot of them are doing it in the simplest form. How many followers do they have? What are they posting? I mean, look, I'm a big believer in in posting things that are about who I am and and things about me personally, but I'm also I also think before I post. You know, it, 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 you know, it, I might be out drinking, but I'm certainly not going to post a picture of me passed out on the bed or, or, sure. or of yeah, my yeah. friend. Because number one is I don't want to do it to him. And number two is it doesn't reflect well on me. So, you know, these are things that you have to think about. But also your personal influence is something that companies are looking for. Now, yes, it all depends on what level you're at in an organization. And if you're a basic line worker, it's way less important than if you're a senior executive. But number one is, I would gather the majority of people listening to your podcast are probably educated and a little bit higher on the career track. So I am gearing my conversation there. But if you look at it from the other side, I tell companies all the time, I mean, Burger King will say something like, well, we don't care about employee advocacy because we don't really want the people working in our restaurants, you know, writing about us. Well, why not? Guess what? It's them and all their friends that are your biggest customers. Why wouldn't you want them sure. sharing that they love your company or they love your product or that there's a great deal or that people should come in at three o'clock because whatever, I mean, whatever it happens to be, why wouldn't you want to take that, that huge amount of people and reach the people that they talk to? So Ted, I'm just looking at my clock here. We've gone half an hour. There's so much we haven't, we haven't delved into. Well, but we'll look, have to do it again. We're I <laughs> know, yeah. So, look, can you tell me what's what projects are you working on now, Ted? We you know where can we find you? You've got books out there. Come on, let us okay, know. Okay, well, you know, look, I'm really easy to find. <laughs> it's Ted Rubin everywhere. At Ted Rubin on Twitter, Ted Rubin on Facebook, uh, Ted Rubin, um, my my author page on Facebook, um, uh, on Instagram, Snapchat, wherever you go, it's Ted Rubin. The only place it's a little different, although if you search Ted Rubin on 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 YouTube, you'll find all my stuff. But my channel there is Ted Rubin USA. Uh, that's because of a little quirk with Google that we don't have to go into right now um, and, and the way things work. 
Um, also, I am working. I have two books out: Return on Relationship, which it Return on Relationship, which came out in January two thousand thirteen, which is the hub of everything I do. I mean, if you ask me, what is the basis of my personal brand? It's Return on Relationship. Two years, two years later, I brought out another book called um, How to Look People in the Eye Digitally which is about how to do what you do when you're face-to-face -face with someone to let them know you're paying attention, but how do you do that online? I have a new book hopefully coming out in January, fingers crossed, knocking on wood, um, that I am not 100% uh, firm on the full title, but it'll be something um, to, to the, it'll be something like The Age of Influence. Is that just yourself, Ted, author? That's just myself. How to Look People on the Eye Digitally was just myself. Return on Relationship I wrote with Kathleen Rose. She supported me in that book. Um, truth be told, that book never would have happened if it wasn't for Catherine because she came to me, said I had to write it. And when I kept putting her off saying that I, I don't write books because it's too hard, she said, I'll help you write it. And she did. So uh, she got the publisher. She brought in the editor. She was fabulous. So God bless Catherine. Otherwise, I wouldn't have any books probably. And then I... And, and then, then you got I the book. just started working on a new kind of topic. You might have seen in my writing, I'm writing a lot more about retail and where things are going in retail. Uh, that's that's mostly because yeah, of my yeah, business yeah. partner, John Andrews. He is a thought leader in the space, and he is writing a book that he has so graciously asked me to co-author called Retail Relevancy. Um, and we are now using a hashtag on a lot of content, Retail, Revel Re retail Relevancy. So check it out. And if you want to reach out to me, feel free anytime. My, you know, my social platforms, my email is tedrubin at gmail.com. And my phone number is 516-270-5511. <laughs> there you go. I did see, actually, when you talk about retail, I did see you rock up to Radio Shack and do a video. Oh, man, <laughs> Radio Shack. What a joke they are. I mean, total joke. You know what that is? That's like a jet.com. It's a total nonsense concept that they're looking to ring up, build a lot of publicity around, and then get, get acquired. There's nothing to it. That's my feeling. Smoke and mirrors, as the expression goes. I don't know if they use that uh, expression in the UK. I think it's a, and this is one of my favorite British expressions, I think it's a brilliant expression. <laughs> I know you do like brilliant, don't you? Just saying. It's a little cheeky, but um, those are a, a few of my other, I have, I have a few British terms that I've kind of adopted a little bit, but uh, um, really enjoy this, Ian. We'll definitely have to do it again. Well, if I can leave you with a, with a quote from an American philosopher. I would love that. Stop, collaborate, and listen. That was vanilla rice. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff, well, Ted. Listen, I've really enjoyed your time with you. So uh, we'll have to speak soon. So thank you very much. Looking forward to you and thank you. That was our friend Ted Rubin over in New York. Ted's work's really gaining traction. I know we'll be seeing and hearing a lot more of Ted soon. So keep your eyes open for that. I hope all your children have an amazing year going back to school. Let's get back at it at work and smash quarter three, ready for the run-in into the final quarter of 2016. Keep in touch, let me know your guest suggestions, review the show and all that good stuff. So I'm Ian Farrah, this is the Industry Angel, and thanks for listening. <laughs>